Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce the heavyweight champion of the world, indeed of planet Earth, Muhammad Ali. Who's the bravest, prettiest dude who talk to the people on the way through? Who's the finest they'll ever be? You got to do a piece, Muhammad Ali. Who's the bravest king of the world? As you see, Mohammed, we've gathered a few of our friends, and I think friends of yours, uh, here this afternoon. Uh, they're going to be asking know. you. I don't know. I see one fell out there. Uh, Did you get an eight on the jaw when you see him? My friend, he knocked me down once. <laughs> We're going to come to that in a second. A lot of these guys have followed you all over the world, writing you about your fights. We've got one or two people from the show business world here, mm -hmm. and we've got some ladies too who are in the uh, business of journalism. Uh, they're going to ask you questions soon. But can I start by asking you uh, a few questions? I want to say first how much of a pleasure it is to see you back in London. And I know that you've said in the past that you regard Britain as your second home. Why is that? Well, when I say that, I really mean sports-wise because um, in many cases you can say Britain can be ranked as number one as far as supporting me is concerned. Uh, I know the boxing authorities and the people when Joe Frazier was recognized as champion and this Jimmy Ellis and, and the little hassles that I had there in the States, they just didn't pay no attention to me and they recognized me as their champion, you know, people and called me uh, the people's champion. And, and I had got a lot of support from here during the days of my Prussian. That's why I always say that about England. Do you regard them as your strongest fans in many ways? Well, you really can't say who's the strongest fans because I'm not the people. I don't know how certain people take it. Uh, one fan was so strong he got killed uh, after a few of my fight with Frazier, the second fight, arguing over idea. And so you really can't say who's much stronger than a man who's dead if he's still living. But I would say that uh, um, it's real debatable. Well, a lot of, lot of real fans here in England. I know you went up to Lancashire on one occasion, didn't you? And you had a lot of strong fans there. Oh, a lot of man. ladies who yeah, gave you a bit of a man. tough time, didn't yes, they? Yes, they did. <laughs> Tell us about it. Well, we went up to a supermarket there and uh, thousands and thousands of people. This was Birmingham and Manchester. And I just never saw so many people in one crowd. And they were crushing each other and, and jumping out in front of the cars and could have got hurt. And this is why I know they're sincere. Are you scared when you see that kind of thing? Well, it frightens you not because of my welfare, but you hate to see people, you know, crowding the stage, trying to get autographs, and you see somebody being squeezed or uh, uh, they're suffering in the crowd because too many people are behind them, and, and this worries you all. Somebody sticking their arm in a moving car and getting caught, and, and these type things are uh, falling in front of a car when we're in big crowds. We just left Zaire. I went back for a week. And we had about 300,000 people lined up from the airport in big crowds just all through the streets. And the drivers were like racing and excited. And little children and people falling, you know, under the front wheel of the car, or in front of the car, and they were stopped just in time. And it would just kill me if, because of me and people admiring me, I look back and see somebody bleeding of mm. squares half to death because they got caught in a crowd. And I feel guilty, you know, so this worries me. You've mentioned Zaya, you've mentioned this country, and of course you've mentioned your own country. Where do you think uh, you are at your happiest? And in what kind of company? When I met my happiest was, uh, was when I'm in Chicago with my three little girls and my boy and my wife in my mobile home somewhere on the highway eating hamburgers. No press and no bad around. Yeah, right. <laughs> you said that those three girls of yours are really quite dangerous, aren't they? Yeah, they What do you mean when you say that? Dangerous because they're pretty. And <laughs> when they get to be about, I imagine, 18 and 19, I'm going to be in trouble. Some fellow told me the reason you have three girls and one boy is because you're going to be paid back for all the <laughs> wrong you've done. <laughs> Lord. <laughs> but don't you think those, those kids, great kids that they are, uh, are going to have a problem uh, when they grow up because their father was the greatest of all time? Well, I think uh, it can present not a serious problem, but wherever you go, people will point to you and say this or that. But uh, if you keep quiet and don't publicize it, I'm sure that people really won't know who you are. And Joe Lewis's daughter was uh, about... Uh, uh, was handling some job or core thing in Chicago and didn't nobody know it was his daughter until she really told somebody, you know, if you just keep it quiet. The way they handle themselves, right. really. Yeah. What did your mother want for you when you were a, a young lad, Mohammed? 
She just wanted me to, like all mothers, basically, to go to school, to get education, to stay out of trouble, stay out of bad gangs, and try to be somebody in life, that's all. Yeah. When did you know that you were the greatest? Well, uh, when, when, when did I know I was the greatest? Yeah. Let me see, I was born in 1942. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I was 12 years old, I figured I had a great chance of being a fighter. Yeah. When I was 12. You've had so many high spots in your career, in your life, I know that, and a lot of people think that your life is a very glamorous one, and you may think that's true too, but there must have been bad moments in your career and in your life, uh, Mohammed. Can well, you recall any? Well, ones? you know, the first Frazier fight, you know, I was off three and a half years, that was bad, and uh, over here, oh, a terrible moment in my life. Oh, <laughs> it was around 1963 when that Henry Cooper hit me. <laughs> He hit me with a left hook. That lick was so hard, it jarred my color friends in America. <laughs> Henry, let me bring you in on this one, because, in fact, if that bell hadn't sounded, do you think you could have nailed Mohammed in that round? Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> definitely. You've he was gone. He was gone. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, he was Henry, gone. come up. Can we have an action replay on you that? You're trying That's to start some drama. Happen, <laughs> come on. I can't give the white way now. <laughs> Henry now. still looks good, too. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have no fat on or nothing. Show us how the no, I'll, show, I'll show you what I was doing. I was Very. in the corner. Come he was on. Going backwards from yeah, I was in the corner Stop jabbing. Boy, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's running good. And that was it. Yeah, man. <laughs> fast. He hit me so fast, he hit me for God got the news. <laughs> He's a great guy. <laughs> Come and sit down, Mohammed. Yeah. Good to have you, Henry. I know we have another fighter here. Henry looks here. like he can still fight so if he wanted to. I'd like to introduce to you, if I know <coughs> Mohammed. His name is Len Harvey. He was one of the greatest British champions. He was a British champion at three different weights, middle, light, heavy, and heavy, in the 1930s and the early 40s. He fought at every single weight. Can I ask you, Len, would you have fancied your chances in the same ring as Muhammad Ali? Oh, well, sure, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. thought I was the only cockiest fighter. <laughs> <laughs> but let me ask you this. Would you prefer to fight the Muhammad Ali of the 1964s when uh, Henry fought him or the 1974 Muhammad Ali? Uh, I think, to be fair to myself, that uh, I would take the... the uh, the 60... The 64? 64, yes. You think you'd have had an easier task if you could have had an easier task I at all? I think that, uh, I'm a, uh, <laughs> won a lot of, you know, a lot of fights after that, and, and he, he began to get good just when it's time for him to, you know, back up. I see. Ray, he, I know that you've got a, you want he to make a point He me when I was at my fastest, right? Right. <laughs> he must have been fast. Was he? <laughs> was he was very fast. He was he very was? fast. Yeah. Reg, come in. I know there's a question that uh, you want to put on at this point. Yes. I, I, I think Len could hold as good as you, Mohammed, which would have been very worrying. Now, I, I, you're, a you're, a, you're, you're, a boxing, you're a boxing student, and uh, I wouldn't want to take you on in that field, but having, having, Len, having said I'm a that... student. Oh, yes, you, you say you're a student, and you're an expert. This is why you're... Well, professor. Oh, exactly. <laughs> I bow to your superior knowledge at all times. You know that. Would the 1964 then Cassius Clay have beaten the present Muhammad Ali, one with the style and the speed and now the one with the weight and the strategy how would you have fought yourself then well they you know like people really they, they this is why they underestimated me they forgot about what i can do you know they got blind they talk about weight i went in there fighting george ran about 213 pounds and this was one pound heavier than sonny lister when i was hot in my prime i wasn't heavy i don't know why they keep saying weight and um uh, I would say that the moving and the dancing, I could still do that, man. Yeah, I didn't want to do that because I would have gotten too tired at the pace. I danced about one round. The first round, I kind of moved, and I was a little too tired for one round. And figuring out I had 14 more rounds to go, this pace I couldn't keep up. And I had to move three or four steps to his one because he was cutting the ring off pretty good. I was surprised he could corner me like he could. So I was, if I'd kept that pace up and dancing for seven, eight rounds, I would have had to resolve to the ropes from actual ex exhaustion and tiredness, and then probably he would have got one through. So I said, I'm going to lay on the ropes first and let him throw all the punches, and if he don't have nothing too dangerous, then I'll stay on the ropes and leave tire out, and that's what he did. But uh, that type style, fighting um, the, the uh, as you say, cash is clear, 64, would have won easy, the 64 style, because uh, I would have moved, I would have kept moving and laying on the ropes wouldn't have bothered me like it did George because 
if a man lays on the ropes, I'll just jab in and back off of him and, and I'll tag him. And if I'm really hitting him, I'll keep hitting him. But if I'm not landing, see, George didn't have enough sense to realize he was not landing. He just kept throwing and throwing and throwing, ran out of gas, or what you all call it, petrol, and it wasn't a station around nowhere. Do you feel? <laughs> see? So the first Cassius Clay doing the hopping and jumping would have beat that man on the rope style because I never would have came in hitting range. I stayed off.